Welcome back to AP Chemistry. In this series of lessons, we're going to be continuing our discussion of chemical kinetics, and this time looking at reaction mechanisms. So actually how chemical reactions take place and the intricacies behind that. Now let's start our discussion by looking at a very simple chemical reaction. So here we have a molecule of H2, and it's going to react with a more molecule of chlorine, Cl2, to make two molecules of HCl. So if we can if we could imagine two molecules here, one of hydrogen, one of chlorine, just floating around in space, we know that in order for them to react, they're going to have to collide. This is something that we've learned earlier in our uh, chemistry journey. And in order for them to react, they have to collide, but not just any collision. They have to have, first of all, sufficient energy in that collision. So that means that they can't just hit very softly or just barely touch. They have to really collide with a lot of force in order to make those molecules stick together and undergo a chemical reaction. Now, second of all, they also have to collide with the correct orientation. That means in the right direction. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that we have these two molecules as an example, and they collide like this. Well, that's the wrong direction. That's the wrong orientation. In order for them to, to react, they're going to have to collide or uh, hit each other in the right direction, the right orientation. So it might look like this. Now, we can illustrate that by playing with Legos. Perhaps you've used those before. And you know that those Legos fit together only in a certain direction. If you take the raised ends of two Legos and try to stick them together, they're not going to stick together no matter how hard you try. You have to stick them together in the right way. And it's the same way with these molecules. They only react if they collide with sufficient energy, as we can see here, and the right orientation or the right direction. So when they do, well, then they're going to fuse together. And this is what we call an activated complex. Now, this is actually a molecule, and we can actually write a formula for this if we really want to. This seems to be a molecule of H2Cl2, which is not in the reaction at all. Now, this H2Cl2 is an activated complex. It's a very unstable, which means it doesn't last very long. It has a very high energy, which means, once again, it's not going to last very long. And it's a temporary molecule. It's this very temporary almost like a transition state is what it's sometimes called. And it's formed after the reactant state, but before the product state. So this activated complex or this transition state is very tenuous. It's not going to last very long at all. Now, we know that because if we think about the bonding, you know, uh, chlorine has seven valence electrons and it only really can form one bond. So this, this, two bond business here with chlorine is not going to last very long. Same thing with hydrogen. It's, it's not going to be able to, to form these two bonds for very long. So that means that two of those four bonds that we see here are going to have to break. And it could be the two new bonds that were just formed, in which case we are back to where we started from. But if those two new bonds break, the new bond, or I'm sorry, those two original bonds break, then we're going to have product molecules. And we're going to have, as we see here, a molecule of HCl, hydrogen chloride, and another molecule of hydrogen chloride right here. And so this is just the basic idea of how chemical reactions take place. There has to be a collision there. Now, let's think about this in terms of energy. If we plot the energy of this reaction as time progresses, well, maybe we could start right here. And the reaction, you know, the whole reaction tends to increase. And then it gets to a peak. And then it starts to fall. And then it falls even lower than where it started in this case. And then eventually it starts to level out. So we're going to take this energy profile or this energy diagram here, and we're going to plot a few uh, characteristics on here. So the first thing that we want to look at would be the energy of the reactants. Now the energy of the reactants is basically the energy from right here all the way to the bottom. Now that makes sense because the reactants are at the beginning and it looks like this is what we have 
at the beginning. So hopefully that's pretty easy to identify. Now, this big peak in the middle, that represents the activated complex. Now notice it's very high energy. We put that in our definition of an activated complex. It's the highest energy uh, thing in this entire reaction. It's very high energy and it's up at that peak. It doesn't seem to last very long. So that's the activated complex. And you can probably guess where the products are. The products are over here at the end. So the energy of the products are down here. Now, we have a couple of other characteristics here. We have the activation energy. Now that's the distance from the starting point right here up to the peak. And the activation energy is sometimes abbreviated as E sub A for energy of activation. And the activation energy is basically just the amount of energy it takes for the reaction to get started. And we know that some uh, reactions have a very high activation energy. Some reactions have a very low activation energy. So we can imagine possibly, oh, let's say someone taking a match and striking the match on the side of the matchbox. Well, if they just barely rub that match against the matchbox, it's not going to light because they're not supplying the sufficient activation energy. You know that to strike the match, you really have to you know, strike that thing on the side of the box, and you're giving the activation energy to make that reaction go. So some uh, reactions have a very high activation energy, some are fairly low. Now, the last feature I want to share with you here is the change in enthalpy. Now, in this course, we've already talked about this quite a bit. The change in enthalpy uh, is the delta H. We've learned about that already in this course, and we've learned several ways to calculate that, in fact, in AP Chemistry. And we know that the change in enthalpy is just the distance from the beginning to the end. And so this tells us if the reaction is going to be exothermic or endothermic, and to what extent. Now, is this reaction exothermic or endothermic? Well, I hope that you can look at this and realize that we start out with a certain amount of energy here and then it looks like we have lost energy throughout the course of the reaction. So that means it's lost energy to the surroundings. So this is what we would call an exothermic reaction. And we've learned about that in this class already quite extensively. So exothermic is giving off energy and I can just draw a little plot here of what endothermic would look like. We would, end, we would start at a certain level and then we'd end up higher than we started with. That's what an endothermic reaction would look like. It, it seems like it's gaining heat or enthalpy throughout the course of the chemical reaction. Now, once again, you should be able to tell if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic just by looking at the graph. So we have a couple ways to, to tell that there. If it looks like this, it's exo. If it looks like this, it's endothermic, absorbing heat from the surroundings. So let's talk about four ways to speed up a chemical reaction. So in uh, first year chemistry, you likely have learned this, but this is a good review. Probably the, the most common way is just to raise the temperature. And we know that that's effective because when you raise the temperature, it means that molecules are moving faster. So they're colliding more often. You know, when they are moving faster, they collide more often, and they also collide with more force since they're moving faster. So as a result, you're going to have more collisions, and you're also going to have more effective collisions that result in an actual reaction taking place. In industry, there's a, a rule of thumb, and this is just an approximation, but normally we say that for every 10 degree increase in temperature, it's going to cause the rate of a typical reaction to double. Now, like I say, that's just a, a, rate, a rule of thumb, but that is uh, a pretty good way to, to talk about this. Now, another way to speed up a reaction is to increase the concentration. And we know that when you increase the concentration uh, of the reactants, it means that the molecules are packed more closely together. So they're going to collide more frequently. So um, we can imagine, uh, for example, cars on uh, a very busy street where everything is very close to each other and the, 
the the cars are are compacted in a small area, maybe like in Manhattan in New York City. And since the molecules, the, the cars are packed more closely together, you're likely to have more collisions. Now contrast that with a country road out in the middle of nowhere where you barely even see a car, you're very unlikely to have a collision with another car. Well, it's the same thing here. When you smash those molecules more closely together, you know, increase the concentration, it's going to cause the reaction rate to increase. And so that would be like if you uh, were to spill uh, concentrated hydrochloric acid on your skin. That would be a big deal. You've got to get that washed off quickly, as opposed to if you spilled a little bit of uh, dilute vinegar on your skin. You know, you can just wash that off, and it, it's, it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to react very fast. So concentration. The third way to speed up a reaction is to decrease the particle size. And so if you have a big chunk of something, it's going to react much more slowly than if you grind that up into something that's much smaller. And that's because the reactants have a greater surface area. And so in chemistry, we say that increases the number of active sites or spots where the actual chemical reaction can take place. Now, the fourth way to speed up a reaction is to add a catalyst. And a catalyst is a molecule or some substance that speeds up a reaction without being consumed. We'll talk more about that in the next uh, video. Now, catalysts do this by lowering the activation energy of the reaction. Now, how do they do that? Well, they provide what we would call a lower energy alternate pathway for the reaction. Now, let me show you what that means graphically. So if this is, this is the same graph that I had up on the screen a few minutes ago, and we can see that this first hill here is the original curve, that original reaction pathway. Well, if we add a catalyst, all of a sudden it changes the way in which these molecules collide with each other. It changes the molecules that actually collide, and we actually change the pathway. And so this little blue uh, uh, curve here would be the catalyzed pathway. And notice that it's lower. The hill is lower. And so we have lower um, activated com or lower energy activated complexes and a lower activation energy. Now, why does lowering the activation energy speed up the reaction? Well, that's because since we have a lower activation energy, more molecules are able to attain that activation energy. And so they're able to move more quickly. Now, this catalyzed reaction has two humps because we're actually changing the way that the reaction takes place. We are uh, turning this reaction into a two-step process. There's the first step, the first hump, and the second step, the second hump. Now, we'll talk more about that in the next video. We'll talk about how molecules react in two steps and what that means for us in chemistry. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a little bit about, chemi a little bit about chemistry. And if you did, please, please give me a thumbs up. And I look forward to seeing you again on this channel. Hope you subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hope we can learn some more chemistry together.